Good morning, listeners. My name is Evan Francine. The date is September 1st, and uh, this is episode 95 of the Unsecurity Podcast. I'm your host today, and joining me is my good friend, Brad Nye. Good morning, Brad. Good morning, Evan. Let's see, you are a nice guy. I predicted that you'd say hi, or something. Yeah. Something. Yeah, you did the something. Uh, for our listeners who are expecting our show to come out yesterday on Monday, we've switched things up. Uh, we are recording the shows on Tuesday mornings now due to crazy schedules. Uh, kids off, ready uh, for school, depending on whether they're in school physically or, um, I guess, remote learning. For the time being, we'll be recording on Tuesday mornings and releasing the podcast around noon. Uh, all right, so same thing each week. Start by catching up. New listeners might not know that we originally started the Unsecurity Podcast so that you and I, meaning you, Brad, and I could find an hour each week to catch up with each other. So let's do that. Let's catch up. What's uh, what's new with you? Uh, you know, not much. I'm, the weather kind of turned this weekend, so it was nice and spent a lot of time outside and just enjoying some really nice weather. Yeah, but that means like winter's coming. I know. Yeah. I don't. Does anybody? There's so few people. We live in Minnesota, and there's so few people. It seems that actually like winter here. I mean, there's a group that does for sure, but I'm in the camp that's like, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. I. Yeah, but it makes you appreciate like everything else. Same with like summer when it's you know, 90 and humid and. Like, gosh, I can't wait for it to get cool again. And then, so. Yeah, there's that. All right, so weather's changing. What else What else is new? How's the family? How's you been out on the bike? Uh, I did. Actually, I didn't. That's which, a little surprising. I did a bunch of, like, just playing with the kids. Um, but now that it's not 90 and humid, I should be able to get out there and ride a bunch more. But oh. yeah, no, it's good. Um, my oldest actually made or is on the high school, one of the high school soccer teams, and their first game is today. So that's pretty exciting. We'll see how long oh, they keep wow. going. But. Do they now? They do they allow fans? Uh, immediate family only. Immediate family only. And so it's that's not six feet apart. It's not me. No. And I think the varsity team, they can get like four people, but you have to be six feet apart and all that stuff. Hmm. And they play for, she plays for Minnetonka. Yep. Okay. Minnetonka High School, you said? Yep. It's crazy how that school has grown. There's so much investment and money in that school district. It's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. I'll be honest. I'm, you know, I'm a little, a little nervous. At least she's outside and everything. But uh, they've got really good protocols. I was really impressed with what they're doing for uh, preparing to go back to school. You know, they put in like MERV 13, which is hospital grade air filters in every classroom. They got like five cloth masks for every student you know, class sizes are reduced to 50% of normal. You know, they put, put a lot of things in place to hopefully minimize the risk. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I love, you know, I went to Minnetonka, so I'm a little, I'm a little, what do you call it, biased? Biased. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. I, uh, here, I'll show you a picture. I went to, um, I rode my motorcycle on Friday. See my face? That's what windburn looks like. I rode my motorcycle on Friday down to Kansas, uh, Lenexa, wow. Kansas. My my son, the one on the left there, he's a police officer for Lenexa Police Department. Okay. Wow. And so it was, uh, yeah. And then the guy on the right is his future father-in-law. So I rode down there to... Uh, you tell him I'm because he's, you know, I, it's so volatile now uh, where, you know, some believe that all police officers are bad, you know, and that's not true. Right. 
there, there are some that are very, actually most are very, very good people that risk their lives every day. So it was good to come down, drive down there, see him, uh, do a little ride with him. And then I back on Saturday. So it was 500 miles on Friday and then almost 500 miles on Saturday. Wow. So that's a long day. That's a lot of time on the bike, man. It, uh, it gets your butt gets a little. And then I came back on Sunday and I did this. Check that out. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So on Sunday, and I'd already planned this. Sunday, I tore out the wall in our kitchen uh, so that um, it's all lath and plaster. You know, our house yeah. was built in 1872, so it's old. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so ripped out all the lath and plaster, ran electrical. So I got a couple new electrical outlets and, you know, you see the deck outside, put a new uh, switch and light on the outside. Nice. And then, uh, yeah, I think today I'll, now everything's all cleaned up and today I'll be buttoning it all up with, uh, she wants shiplap. I guess that's a thing mm. that women like nowadays. Yeah, and then yeah, all my kids were over here, so I had Alyssa, Tyler, Joe. Uh, Joe got um, Joe proposed to his girlfriend on Sunday. I have a new another grandson coming, so that's three because we just had the gender reveal on Sunday. So yeah, life is. You <laughs> you had a busy weekend. I know, man, and then. Just a lot of stuff going on, cool stuff going on at work, you know, uh, doing some work for the state of Minnesota. That's going well. Um, Chubb Insurance, you know, with the S2Me uh, is going really well. Redesigning the whole S2Me to be more consumer friendly. That's kind of fun. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, I'm doing some stuff with uh, Minnesota as well around uh, the election security. So that's, that's pretty fun. And how's that going? Are the counties taking you up on the offer? Uh, not yet, but uh, I think Caleb was out, so okay, he hasn't scheduled those yet. Should get some stuff started today. So, what's the strategy there? It's to help the counties with their information security by getting the fundamentals and basics sort of squared away. Is that? Yep. Yeah, pretty okay. much. And it's under the banner of election security because obviously. I mean, it's just crazy, the world. And that's kind of part of what we're going to talk about today is just how this crazy stuff, uh, you know, affects our jobs, affects information security of our industry. Yeah. And one of those one of those things is, you know, the election is coming up. It's only 60 days away, 60-ish. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and, you know, there's all this infighting, the left is fighting the right. The right is fighting the left. Nobody believes anybody. You know, there's the mail-in ballot thing. And I mean, it's just so much crap going on. So you being in the middle of it and staying objective, like we're here to just protect the integrity, I guess, of the, of the, of the systems and supporting stuff. And availability, I think, right? The two. Yeah. Those are the two. And we're not taking a stance one way or another. You stay focused on the the issue at hand, which is information security. The issue at hand is not, not that you don't account for the political strife and all the other crap that's going on. You just stay out of it. Focus on the right. objective. Yep. Just do the right thing for, from a security perspective, regardless. Yeah. I, quite frankly, I don't, I don't, care about which party it's in the, <laughs> like right like just do the right thing it, it just want the, the you know it's about people like you've always said so well and no and nobody's nobody's faultless right nobody is like so if you were to take a side there's always a counter and so the fact that you can whatever side you want which is fine then 
I mean, nobody's like, I mean, nobody's sinless. We all got issues. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, I, I have enough trouble just trying to keep myself out of trouble. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. So everybody's healthy. How's your, uh, how's your wife doing? Because she works in healthcare, right? Yeah, she's a nurse. So um, she's in a clinic and she still has to go into the office uh, three days a week. So she wears a mask all day at, at work. Is she now getting any kind of like, I know that there's been talk of like acne and all kinds of other skin issues and stuff like that. No, we got some really good um, cloth masks with like that Kona cotton. So it's like a real soft, mm. thin, like fine weave. Um, so she just rotates those and yeah, she hasn't really had any issues. Kona cotton. Is that like the K-O-N-A? Like Kona yep. holy cotton? Okay. Yeah, it's like a that's dark where I went. Hair. That's where I went on my honeymoon. Kona. It's really cool. Yeah. If, so. you, ever, if you ever get the chance. I, at the time, I didn't have any money. <laughs> uh, I was so broke. But my mother had miles you know because she worked for ibm so she oh, had yeah. all these miles from all her travels so her wedding gift to us was essentially our honeymoon which she didn't have to pay a dime for so oh, i guess nice. i should i guess i should thank ibm for my honeymoon and oxy thank all of ibm's customers for my honeymoon <laughs> but kona oh my god it's so amazing yeah i don't it. know if i could live there yeah, if you ever get a chance, man, that that that's the big island, and it's the biggest of the islands. The name of the island that Kona is on is actually called Hawaii. Okay. You know, you've, got, you've got Maui and all the other islands, and uh, on the one side of that island is Kona, and there's two mountains that sort of separate Kona from the other side of the island, which is where Hilo is. Hilo, it's like tropical rainforest. They get like 120 inches of rain a year. It's beautiful. And then you go to the other side of the island, which is the Kona side, and it's like the, it seems like the surface of Mars. Hmm. They get like 20 inches of rain a year. That's crazy. It's, a, yeah, just to, off topic, but it's amazing. Like, if you think about it, you can go like snowboarding on the mountain in the morning and surfing after lunch. Yeah, where, and they got cowboys there. That? They got cowboys there. That uh, ranches in the middle. They've got some of the world's best coffee. You know, they've got tropical rainforests with like you know these beautiful waterfalls, and then you've got a you've got a volcano too. Right. That's spewing lava. Right. It's crazy. That's on. You can do all of that in one day. It's one of the most amazing places on earth. I've never. I mean, I haven't been there. It's crazy cool. So for all the listeners, go to Kona. If you ever get the chance, how expensive it is nowadays. Uh, you know, like I said, I didn't pay for it way back when. I haven't been back, but go. So right now, they have, don't they have like a quarantine on visitors coming in? Yeah, probably. Yeah, they probably do. All right. Anyway, so the... The world is crazy, as you know. I guess it's always been crazy. Now it's like overtly, like in your face, crazy. Yeah. But, so obviously, there's a lot going on this year. Uh, we're about six months into COVID, in terms of the disruption it caused to our business. I think many others. It was March of this year, and this is now September. And so I came up with six months because nine is the number for March. Three is the number for, I'm sorry, three is the number for March. Nine is the number for September. Nine minus three equals six. Yep. Fallen so far? Yep. Logic. I love it. <laughs> uh, but COVID flipped everything upside down. You know, the world on its head, uh, at least that's what it seems like. So for many, uh, you know, COVID is old news if it even though it's not 
we're not out of it yet. And I know that people are tired of talking about it. So I didn't want to talk about COVID as much as I wanted to discuss, you know, our reaction to it and how it's affected information security, trying to stay, you know, as close to like, like you're doing with the elections as close to what it is I know and what it is, you know, as possible. I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a politician. Thank God. Uh, and I'm not a, doctor so but i do know information security and i have observed some of the things that have that have changed and so i don't know if you you're like me brad but i remember the day like it was yesterday it, the day was march 16th this is the day that we closed our office our physical office uh, at security studio and at fr secure and it's just been sort of nuts you know, yeah. ever since. Yeah, it was crazy. I, re I mean, we had that discussion and about what were we were going to do, and we we're like, all right, well, we'll close it for two weeks and see where we're at. Yeah. You know, the hope was that things would go back to relatively normal, and clearly that has not happened. No, and I remember when the president of FR Secure, John Herman, came into my office, and he said, uh, yeah, we're going to close the office. And I was like, why? I mean, that's how I think just naive I was about what was going on, everything. And uh, he said, well, you know, it's just the prudent thing to do. Cause I'm not a fear person. I don't, I don't react to fear much. Um, so I felt like we were reacting to fear at the end of the time, um, which turns out, you know, John made the right call. John and you and the senior management team, executive leadership team. Um, yeah. And, and to just show how unfearful I am. I mean, I went to Sturgis a few weeks ago. I, I self quarantined when I got back for two weeks, I had no symptoms, nothing. And now I'm out of that. So and I did that cause I didn't want to get other people sick. Right. I think that was that was the point. So in our own business, information. So let's assume we were always kind of non-traditional in the way we did business. Um, but let's say we were a traditional business where we had, you know, a centralized, you know, data center or you know something where we have maybe our Active Directory server and you know some other things, maybe a file server and a database or whatever, and the network and people all in an office working together. Security looks one way and then it blows out. Right now everything's decentralized. People are all working from their homes. Um, security is much different, right? Yeah. It, just, it, it looks different, it functions different. Your risks are in different places. And I think some of us haven't yet adjusted to where are the actual risks now? Where should I be focusing my time and money? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that we keep hearing is how can I help secure my the employees networks at home? Mm -hmm. And how do you address that? And, and yeah, you can give them some resources, but uh, yeah, that's a tough thing to try and handle. Well, it's weird too, because it's like we started, we knew that this was, I don't know if we knew this was going to happen. I mean, we didn't know that COVID was going to happen, obviously. But I think we knew that if you really want to be the most effective with information security, you have to address the person, the people. Mm -hmm. And you have to do it in a way that they want to do it, not in a way that they're told to do it, not in a way to give them checklists and stuff, in a way that they actually want to, they embrace it, they see the value in it. Yeah. And uh, so we knew, you know, we've said that people are creatures of habit, so the same good or bad habits they have at home are the same good or bad habits they're going to bring into the workplace. Now that line is blurred where the place and home are basically the same thing. Uh, so in 2017, we developed the S2Me for this reason, 
not because we saw COVID coming, but because we understood that people, we have to figure out the people part. Right. Better. And there, there, there's not a lot of good, easy to understand for the quote unquote normal people resources. Yeah. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, in version one, the STM was released in 2017 and we didn't really focus on much on adoption because we knew it was like version one. It's like, it's not, it was basically just a glorified questionnaire with some scoring and recommendations associated with it. But the concept was there. And then, you know, we went down, we went out with version two, which introduced badges. People like badges. Yep. Yeah, accomplished. People do anything. Yeah, people do anything for a damn badge. It's it's that well, it's the same thing like doing like a capture the flag for security, right? It's that kind of like yeah, I did it. Right. And so that it becomes like a carrot, but it's not really a carrot yet. I think people want necessarily because it's like, all right, it's a carrot, but you know, I don't really like your carrot. That's what it feels like, kind of, which is cool. You know, I get it. Uh, so now we're working on version three. And so the whole point is, now and then COVID happened, right? COVID happened in between all this. It's like, oh, crap. Now everybody's being pushed to home. Mm -hmm. Now the home network actually matters. Yeah. A lot more than it did. And your kids on the same network as you matter. Uh, your personal computers, if they're separate from your work computers, in terms of physical systems, they're on the same network, so that matters. The, the firewall at home matters. Your IoT devices at home matter. Your, you know, it just, it pushed, it pushed the physical boundary from work to home. Right. Yeah, instead of defending one perimeter, you're defending hundreds, some yeah. cases thousands. Right. And so think about like schools. Yeah, I just wrote an article for Dark Reading about this. And, you know, schools had enough trouble securing a few networks. Right. Now you're securing thousands of networks, yeah. or at least they affect your security. Well, and, you know, we work with a lot of schools, school districts, and I can tell you that they are just basically all focus is on remote learning, period. Like everything else, unless it's critical, is on hold. Yeah. And so when, if you, if you play out where we've been, how many organizations do you think just wanted to survive? Mm -hmm. you know just get it up and running i don't give a crap about security because security is just going to get in the way right now get them all vpns get them all connected get the you know get the traffic flowing make sure the applications can handle the load do we have support structure in place who are they going to call you know just all these things that went into pushing things out because nobody i don't think anybody not anybody but very 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 few people were prepared for this Right. Yeah. Well, and, and now, you know, we're seeing, well, if there's an incident well, nobody's there or if a server goes down, somebody has to drive in to handle it. Right. Like you're, you're having a delay in service. You're having a delay in response. If there was, you know, something suspicious going on, just all these things that people just didn't think about. Right. And so now, and so the sad thing about the way security works, when you tack on security after the fact, it's much less effective than building security into it. Mm -hmm. So you deployed a bunch of laptops, whatever, you know, whatever you did, you know, meaning you, the listeners or, you know, companies in general, they pushed it out quickly. Uh, a lot of companies were lacking in training and awareness. So you not only did you push out the network and so the physical security is drastically different. The technical security is drastically different. 
and the personnel security is drastically different. Your training and awareness, which you were training people on before, I think lacked in a couple of ways. One, you were telling people how to protect the company. Mm-hmm. You weren't telling people how to protect themselves and then leveraging that to protect the company. Right. Yeah. It's different. Oh, yeah. You, you want people buying in and invested in a security program. And the way you do that, like you said, is get them to understand and, and protect themselves. And by extension, they'll protect the organization because they're doing the right thing. Yep. So in terms of our jobs, everything, everything changed. Uh, the, the basic concepts are still all the same, right? Asset yep. management. I can only protect the things I know I, I have. Ex, you know, access control, change control, configuration management. All those things still apply because I can only secure the things I can control. The challenge is now... You had, you had, I almost said a bad word, crappy asset management before. <laughs> now you have crappier asset management because now not only do you, oh my God, it gets crazy. Because not only did, did you have not know all the devices, maybe all the applications, maybe all the data and where it was when you were at on-prem, now that you're all remote, should you account for the assets on people's home networks also in your asset inventory if they affect your ability to secure things? And, and what's the liability and the legal repercussions and all that of, you know, all right, do you have your employee, did you give them a device? Are they using their home computer and doing a VPN and remote desktop type of situation? You know, there's just, yeah, so many different things you have to now take into to account that what weren't really you know an issue before right or certainly not as significant that's you know yeah so the crazy thing is they say that this is going to become and we don't have a crystal ball but you know this is going to become kind of the new normal well, that people are enjoying working from home they're not going to come back to the office well if you look at Look at the companies that have said, yeah, you can be remote indefinitely. I mean, Okta, I think, was the latest one that just came out and said, you know, the majority of their employees can just stay remote. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've got so many companies that are at remote through at least the end of the year, you know. So, yes, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. No. And so the dust... The dust hasn't settled yet on information security in this new way of doing business. And the sad thing is you see checklist after checklist after checklist. You see news article after news article after news article on how to protect work from home, how to protect remote work. And there's all kinds of, you know, good tidbits of advice out there, but What's lacking is how do I actually apply it in the most effective way possible? I know this stuff. I mean, most people you talk to, hey, did you know you should choose strong passwords? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, even even my mother knows that. You know what I mean? And and she's 70, almost 80 years old. So it's not that you don't know a lot of these things. It's the fact that you don't know which thing to do next and you don't fully appreciate what's in it for you. I think. Yeah, I can see that. You know, if, um, so. Well, you know, and then, we do like of these incident responses where, you know, everything is down and, you know, now, as an employee that's maybe not directly working on remediation, getting things back up and functional, the effect on you is still significant, right? You can't do your job. You've got customers calling you and now you're unable to do anything because somebody clicked on an email and didn't record it or right. Just not realizing 
so many things. So it, yeah, every, everybody is uh, impacted when something like that happens. Right. And the criminal, and so you combine all of this kind of confusion. And I think, you know, some companies, I think another, you know, I don't, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much, but we've got a pride issue in certain places within our industry too, where oh, I got it. I got it handled. You yeah. know, we deployed uh, endpoint protection and got everything all buttoned down. Not a worry. It's like, well, but still you have the human being that mm -hmm. is still ill-equipped to use the device that you gave them still ill-equipped to use the email, to use the internet, to use all these things. They use them. Yes. They get what they need done, but they don't use them in a safe manner. Right. You know, it's like driving down the road without, you know, understanding the rules of the road, without understanding what all these traffic signs mean, without wearing a seatbelt, without having an airbag. So, I don't know, we got a lot of work to do, I think. And I think we're on the right path, because one of the things I was thinking about, too, is, you know, we do a lot of risk assessments. Because, you know, we, under, we understand that information security is about risk management. So I can't manage something that I don't understand. I can't make decisions about something that I don't understand. So we do a lot of risk assessments. The one that we do today is the S2 org. Mm -hmm. But how much less valid is a traditional methodology like the S2 org in a new world, in the new place we're at? You know, uh, the biggest part, I think, is around, you know, the, the physical. You know, we do talk about, do you have guidelines and things for remote workers and, and all that? I, I think the vast majority of it is still very valid. Um, but yeah, what happens with now that there isn't an office, right? If you're completely a cloud-based organization, there's what what is there? Now, I think that to some extent there is stuff, but that's probably the biggest thing. Because, um, like I said, we we talk about everything else is still valid. Um, it it takes a new. Cough. What's that? I just coughed right in the uh, microphone. I thought I muted myself, but I didn't. It was muted. I didn't hear it. You're good. Good. Um, but, you know, the tech, internal technical controls take on a new aspect. Uh, looking at those a little bit differently. But, you know, the, I, th I really, th I think the, the majority of it is still incredibly relevant. I think the content is, I think there's a couple of things that are concerning me that, and actually we're working on redesign, not redesign, just refinement. You're always working on refinement, right? The world changes. If you have a methodology that isn't flexible, that can't change with the world, it's a, I mean, it, it becomes obsolete quickly. Right. Because uh, I think one of the things with, a lot of the content is still relevant. However, the way scores are calculated, the way weights are assigned, mm -hmm. you know, has changed drastically. Yeah. And so we're working on trying to figure out, you know, in the algorithm, what parts need to be emphasized more and less. And, and even then, even though we're pretty flexible in our methodology, we can't deploy till we've communicated to all the users who use it because they're going to see scores go from you know one way or the other they're not stay the same they're gonna you're gonna have a you know i'd guess maybe a five to ten percent variability in score plus or minus yeah and we learned from our we learned our lesson from when we recalculated you know internal vulnerability scanning that we're not just gonna like deploy it and be like oh crap you don't you don't know why your score just dropped 30 points <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think we communicated there was going to be a change, but not what the impact of that change would be. Yeah. So lesson learned on that. Yeah, for sure. So we're trying to prepare that. But then I think a second piece that I really see us 
work more on is we have the S2 me, so we have the ability to measure, and you can argue the effectiveness of the measurement. It's better than nothing, and it's better than I think anything else I've seen, and it'll just keep getting better. But we have the ability to collect information from home users in a way that it's not it's not biased. If I tell you that this assessment is for you to protect you, protect your family, your company does not see results, your individual results. They don't, um, you know, so if you give false information in that assessment, you're only help, you're hurting yourself really. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't even show like those aggregated results until there's a large enough sample size that you couldn't identify or single anyone out. Right. Exactly. So if we can leverage the S2 me into the S2 team, and which we already have, we already figured that one out. Now the next part is how should the S2 team results affect your overall risk assessment with the S2 org? So there's a merry, a marrying that has to take place. Yeah. Because then your risk assessment is truly more reflective of the real world. Yeah, and honestly, if you think about it, it probably should be a fairly hefty weighting, right? Because this is what your employees are actually doing, not what you say you're going to do, not what your policies say you're doing. It's what's actually happening. Right. Well, I think there's always three things in my mind that have to be in place for a metric or a score to be valid. And nobody's really argued with it. So I think it's valid in the real world too is, one, it has to be objective. So whatever you're gonna to use to score something, it has to be objective. It has to be yes, no, on or off, one or no. Right. It also has to be applied consistently. So whatever metric you're using, it's the same wherever you put it. And then the third thing is it has to be relevant to whatever it is you're measuring. So if we're measuring risk, what are the characteristics of risk at home that I can make a, an objective, either you're doing this or you're not doing this and then create. So I think the weighting will depend on Gosh, you, you'd, you couldn't even use, I don't think you could use that aggregate score either. You'd have to do it by, by section because yeah. there's different, different weights for, you know, what the risk to the organization for, you know, using one machine for everything is different than do they have a personal incident response plan? Right. Well, and I think, so the weighting so the section weighting can be integrated and weaved into sections of the S2 org, I think. Yeah. And then weights applied based on how many people you have working remotely, what percentage of your workforce is working remotely. Yeah. And maybe one or two other criteria, but that's the part I'm, we're putting together now and then we'll, put it out for debate with you, you know, the content committee and uh, our dev team and others. Cause that's the part that I'm trying to figure out next, because what I want people to do is don't ignore the shift. Don't ignore the shift in risk. The risk is shifted. Right. Pre COVID. If you're using pre COVID risk assets and being, your risk decisions based on those risk assessments, there's a certain level of invalidity to it. It's not as yeah. valid as it was. No, I'm I, not saying it's completely invalid. It's just not as valid as it was. Right. Right. Well, that's why, you know, we, we constantly say, don't just do an assessment and that's it. it the, the risks and the threat landscape and everything, it's constantly changing. Right. You know, so you can't just keep right. doing the same thing you've always done. You have to take those, those changes into account. Yeah. Yep. So ideally, you know, 
future. And I think we can get this thing to deployed hopefully before fourth quarter, because I think it would be a lot of people do the assessments in fourth and then use the information from those as risk assessments to plan for 2021 budget. And it'd be nice to get this deployed earlier that you can account for, you know, should I help my home users maybe with, uh, you know, antivirus, even though I'm secured, I've secured the endpoint for my system, uh, you know, 80% of my users, just hypothetically, then it's probably not true. 80% of my users don't have antivirus or up-to-date antivirus on their home systems, which are on the same network as the system I deployed for you. Yeah. And, well, if that's true, then why don't I negotiate a group rate on McAfee or Symantec or whatever antivirus you want to use and then encourage all the users, hey, install this antivirus. It's 50% off. And the real reason why we're deploying it to you is because we want you to protect your family better. Right. Yeah. That's a different story than what we traditionally say now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, even, even I think putting together a list of things that people could, you know, hey, here's antivirus that we recommend and having a couple options or, you know, make sure you're doing patches and give them some tutorials and, and just some, and resources written for the normal person, not the security or IT focus that we typically see. You gotta be very deliberate in how you write these things out without being condescending and talking down too, right? Because if, right. if you dumb it down too much, then people will be like insulted. And what, what happens in that case? Well, they're not gonna follow it. That's why I think we want the content to be relevant to your level of understanding of information security and technology for one, and we also want the message to be from the community more so than from a company. You know, so then it doesn't come off as condescending. It comes off as, you know, 80% of the community is using a password manager mm -hmm. for these reasons, to protect their financial accounts or whatever you message you put there. So then not only do people feel like I, the company is supporting me and protecting my home, protecting my children. But I also feel this community push of like, yeah, everybody's doing it, right? That herd mentality is strong. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. We've got, because we've been getting a lot of feedback from users of the S2Me. And a lot of the things are in line with what you're saying too. It's uh I think there are four different dialects, maybe, of normal people speak in terms of technology. And so we've called them technology dependent, technology enabled, technology, actually dependent, tech enabled, tech aware, and tech challenged. I can see that. Yeah, and the tech dependent are primarily people under the age of 35. And, uh, you know, there's a couple other criteria that go into that. And the reason why 35 became like a really interesting age was because 13 years ago, the iPhone became, mm -hmm. the first iPhone was released. And so these people were 20, these people were 22 years old. Yeah. The 35 year olds today. And, you know, so 35 and younger, and that's not just 35 year olds. And then it was 2003, it was 17 years ago, G was released. What which led it, to the, it, what's that? Well, it garbled what was released in 2003? Oh, 3G. Okay. Yep. So that, what 3G brought was data mm -hmm. to mobile devices. 
right? That's when everybody started doing this a lot more, you know, head down, looking at their phone. The iPhone just exacerbated that more. So in 2003, the 35 year olds were 18. So I think that's the top end of what's, you know, maybe you might call tech dependent. There's a couple other criteria there, but those are tech dependent people. That makes sense. Yeah. And then the tech enabled people are, you know, 35 ish to 60. Actually tech dependent really is 20 and below the up to maybe 35. But uh, so anyway, we're trying to figure this stuff out so that we can speak their language. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause you, yeah. You have to talk differently to different people. Right. And so not only within, do we have, okay. A lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, risk has changed. Information security has changed drastically. So trying to figure out all the ways that it changed so that you can make your solutions as effective as possible. It's not about, you know, the cool thing about working for us, you and me and, and everybody else who works here is we're so devoted to the mission that it's like, I just want to solve the damn problem. Mm -hmm. If you make money, great. I mean, I'd like to keep the lights on. I'd like to keep feeding the kids. They, they like food, you know, you know, but what will end up happening is I think is if you focus on the mission, you'll make plenty of money. If you focus on the money, you miss the mission. And so focusing on the mission, you, you start coming up with these ideas that I think are multi-billion dollar ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think they'll be for people who like money. I, I just, I'm just not a big fan of money because I just waste it, you know. I'm just not a good person with money. So you just don't want to give me any more. The, uh, so I think a lot of these things are coming together. Well, it's going to be really neat to see by the end of the year, how we've integrated our existing assessment methodology that we've been using for, I don't know, there's probably three, 4,000 companies now or S2 scores that have been generated using the S2 org methodology to now marry that with an S2 team and an S2 me component so that you can truly measure like, what is the real risk here? Not yeah. never, and you'll never get it perfect. Right. So don't try to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it, no, I, I mean, I think it makes sense to, to do that and, you know, to, to truly take what your employees are doing and what they know and, and account for that risk because again, I can't tell you how many times people are like, well, this is what the policy says. And then you talk to somebody else and, you know, independent of that and they have no idea what you're talking about, or they say, Oh no, this is what we actually do. And it's completely different. And the other person has no idea. Yeah. 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 And that's a totally, that's a whole nother thing too, for us to talk about. I mean, it's, it's a branch off of the same topic is how policies yeah. have been misused so much over the years. Policies aren't meant to be root. The reference documents, you know, and you just see people, uh, it's a whole nother thing. All right. Anyway, so that's, those are the on my mind when I was writing the show notes for today was just like, we need to do a better job accounting for this. Your traditional risk assessment methodologies, your traditional approach, to a centralized or a small number of locations is less and less valid than, and, and maybe even become in at some point. Yeah. Huh. Well, good. Uh, hmm. Do you have anything else to add about just kind of the new thing with, because you do a lot of the incident response stuff, or at least you're very involved in that. And I know you're working on a new methodology right now. Yeah on incident response assessment, which will also be married up at some point when it's mature and ready. Uh, I think the biggest, one of the biggest risks that we're seeing out of this is, you know, unsurprisingly, the, the attackers are using, a, and I, I, I use this word carefully, disaster, right? So anytime you have some big event that happens, you'll see you know, the fundraising scams or the, you know, whatever we're, you're, you're seeing a lot of that and a lot of, a lot more fishing. 
yeah, and hopefully as you develop this methodology, you'll be accounting for, and I'm sure you will. I mean, I'm excited to see it when you guys, you know, have a version to share, but it'll be uh, incorporating, you know, how we incorporate where the incidents are actually happening too, because you know, they're, if they're happening at home a lot more, uh, you mentioned earlier about the personal incident response plan. There's a couple of reasons why I think that's very valid for a company. One is shows that if I have a personal incident response plan that I understand enough about security to be prepared for the bad thing. So there's a certain awareness that comes with it. And I think the second thing is if my employees are being attacked and they don't have a method you know, to respond to it themselves personally, well, they're not gonna be very productive at work for one, because mm -hmm. they're undoing all the damage that's done to them, you know, by right. an attacker or whatever. Uh, and number two, I think there'll be some fear with people. I mean, I think people who don't plan are more fearful uh, because they don't really understand. Well, I think fear a lot of times comes from lack of understanding. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're unprepared. And you, yeah, you, you, it's not a good combination. No. So I think there's maybe a tie in too, but even a tie in or a pass through, um, you know, an S2 me to an S2 team to an S2 org to your incident response, deeper dive assessment that you're building now. Yeah. It's cool. It's cool being, it's cool working with smart people, man. Fun. You know, it really is. All right. Um, all right. Another thing I had, uh, just, you know, the world, going back to where we started, you know, the world has changed much. Uh, May 25th and May 26th are also days I remember well from this year. May 25th was Memorial Day. Uh, it started off like in Memorial Day. I, I, I come from a, a military family, so... Memorial Day has a deeper meaning, I think, for military families, because it's a holiday to celebrate the people who gave their lives in the service of their country. Right. Which I think is a super noble thing, right? When somebody else gives their life for you and your freedom, that's a really big deal. Uh, but May 25th uh, was also the day that George Floyd, uh, the whole George Floyd, and I'm not going to must try to stay away as much as possible from controversial around it. The fact is May 25th was the day that George Floyd the the events of George Floyd happened. Uh, and it wasn't until the 26th that I heard about it because uh, I was kind of disconnected from the news and came back and got reconnected. And I was like, what, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, crazy. All of it's crazy. I mean, the, the events that happened were crazy. The events around it are crazy. The events afterwards are crazy. The reactions are crazy. It's just like yeah. crazy. And I haven't fully, there's so much emotion in it too that I haven't fully appreciated or even appreciated much actually about how this affects information security. But I know there's an effect there. You know, do you feel it? Yeah, I think it it goes to both again the the more uh, social engineering attacks um, uh, around it, um, but also what it, it affects the physical security of organizations. Like we've seen, unfortunately, seen the damage. So how are you accounting for your location? Are you in? You know, we we saw what happened in downtown Minneapolis and the destruction yeah. there, right? So how are you taking those things into consideration? Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the, one of the things I've never seen as much as I see now after May 25th is just the bullying, mm -hmm. you know, just the, uh, you can't say what's on your mind sometimes because people will, tweet. 
use it against you if you for it. If I disagree with you, uh, you know, we throw out, there's two things that people do uh, almost immediately whenever they can't defend their position well. Okay. Meaning, I'm taking this position. I, if you, you come with a counter position or you come with questions about my position, you may just be curious about my position, right? You may not even be attacking me at all. Right. But if I perceive it as an attack or I can't defend my position well, and if you can't defend your position well, you do one of two things, mostly. You either change the subject or I attack your character. Mm -hmm. So if, I'm, if I've got a position and I don't understand my position well enough to defend it, maybe it's all emotion, maybe it's right brain stuff. Uh, and then you ask me about my position or let's say you challenge my position. What, I'll prob what we see a lot going on right now is I'm going to attack you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you bigot, you racist, you whatever, 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 which are all detracting from the point. The point is explain your position so that either I can support it or I can fight it. Right. Or I can ignore it. But we don't see enough. So the one, no, we don't. Yeah. And I don't know what the information security impacts of this are, you know, as you start to try to figure it out and play it out. I know that there are impacts because it, it, it impacts society and society is made up of people. And I know that information security isn't about information or security as much as it is about people. So if it's affecting people, it's affecting security. I just don't, we got to get our hands around it, and figure it out a little bit. Well, I think, you know, you, you got to think of it from, are, are these people going on websites and posting from corporate machines now that are remote? Are they making posts on Facebook or wherever? that are, you know, inflammatory or whatever it may be. And they say, I work for, you know, XYZ Corp. And now you've got that on your hands that you're having to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd love to see, I mean, I truly, man, I would love to see love prevail. You know I mean? It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, fighting it doesn't have to be destruction it can be let's sit down let's talk about the issues let's come up with solutions let's work together let's make the world a better place let's not tear it down right you know? so anyway i don't know the you know that's the second kind of big thing in mind that about this year is you know COVID, obviously and then the second is just all the social injustice and we could go into talking about elections and how that affects security too uh, but yeah maybe that's just a topic for another day yeah there's a lot a lot to unpack there is but i love having these discussions and i talk a lot more sorry during these discussions because there's just a lot on my mind and it's like man i want to the saddest one of the saddest things that happens so so, so often is you know, events that shake the world happen and then we don't capitalize on it. Yeah, yeah. This is a great opportunity for us to make security better, to to cut through the fear and uncertainty and help people become more understanding. And, you know, there's just so much opportunity to use this for good. And I'd like this, I'd like us to do that. And I think you would too. I mean, everybody at FR Secure and Security Studio feels the same way. Yeah, I mean, we're, how businesses are operating has fundamentally changed. Let's take this opportunity with the, all this change going on to improve things based on this new environment, new, you know, reality. Yep. Yeah, it's cool, man. I love working with you. All right, so this is a year like no other, that's for sure. I truly, I'm hoping and, and praying love will prevail. I think, uh, and love will ultimately prevail. It, it always does, but to see people work together is all the issues at the root of the issues for, you know, like take even Black Lives Matter, right? At the root of that, I agree a, a 
you know, a hundred percent. Yes, black lives do matter. So let's make black lives better. Right. You know, yeah. that's going to take love. It's not going to take hate. Hate's going to make it worse. Yeah. Yeah, no, I fully agree. And, you know, I think we've talked about it with uh, you know, the, re- the you know, vendors that FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And that's what we see. It's people that have fear, uncertainty, and, and doubt. And FUD never, that's, it's never a good thing. No. No, so the, there's always good and evil, right? I mean, the evil will take advantage of this to take advantage of you, period. The good will do whatever they can to help you, to take advantage of it for good, right? To make you stronger, make you more educated, make you better, right? And so that's cool. All right, news. Yay. Uh, newsy things. Uh, there are some news I thought was interesting to or related to the news items that I called out. Uh, the first one is kind of a follow-up to the second one that I'll talk about. But this comes from Security Affairs. Uh, it's Elon Musk confirms that Russian hackers tried to recruit Tesla employee to plant a malware. Yeah, that's, it, it is a crazy story. It really is, man. Offering a million bucks to this they started, employee. They started at 500000 and the guy was like, eh, that's not enough. And then immediately went to the FBI. So that's pretty awesome. That is awesome to turn him in. The guy's name is Igor Igorovich Kryuchkov, 27 years old. Arrested on August 22nd, appeared in court on August 24th. Russian citizen. You should give that employee like a big raise. Maybe promote them. Yep. Maybe. I don't know the whole story. Maybe the, I don't know. A million bucks though in today's world. If you were ever going to, I mean, everybody's, I suppose everybody's got, I'm told that everybody's got a price. I hope I don't, but I don't know. I'm, I'm a human being, so I suppose I'd probably do too. It would at least have to be enough to where I could retire comfortably because I'm never going to be able to work again. Right. Probably because somebody's going to find out. It's going to have to fund maybe a new identity. In a country with no extradition. <laughs> and a million bucks ain't going to cut it. A million bucks nowadays, through. I mean, chances are, well, first of all, it'll be a lump sum. So you'll probably go out and buy some party stuff and blow some of it second the irs is going to wonder where you got the million bucks but yeah it's like you can just drop a million bucks in a bank and they're like oh cool right you're gonna to have to pay taxes on it so mm-hmm. that's going to be 30 40 50 percent so you're down to about five hundred thousand, you know ish and then uh yeah you're not going to retire on it nope so a million bucks yeah, just wouldn't cut it. But it's such an interesting story. And, you know, that's the second story I have is from the Hacker News. And this one comes a little bit earlier. It says, Russian arrested after offering a million dollars to U.S. company employee for planting malware. At this time, we didn't know the company. It was um, it was sort of sealed in the court documents. Later, we found out it was Tesla. So numerous times, this they met numerous times between August 1st and August 21st to discuss the conspiracy. I guess Igor originally reached out on July 16th using WhatsApp to contact the employee. It's a really interesting story. So if you read up on it, the the court documents are, are out there, you know, including the charges and the background. It's pretty interesting. It is, yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> and this stuff, you know, for listeners, uh, don't think this is a nice incident. And it's not just the Russians. The Chinese do the same thing. Uh, the Iranians do the same thing. 
uh, any adversary of the United States is looking for a way to do things. And that's not including the criminal enterprise component, right? I don't know what Igor's, I'm guessing it was more money driven. It wasn't, but with Russia, money and politics are so closely integrated. I can't separate the two. Well, they said that one of the guys working was a high level employee at the at a Russian bank, uh, government bank. I mean, what was interesting on that, the Hacker News one is uh, that uh, Igor would, had said he listed out previous companies the gang had targeted and revealed each of these targeted companies had a person working at those who installed malware. So it clearly works. And yes. that's in, that would be interesting to see if that comes out to see if it's some of these really big name companies that have been hit and <laughs> if I'm that if I'm that employee, I would be uh, sweating pretty heavily. Yeah, because you know well, these guys are gonna rat you out in no time. They don't oh, care. yeah. There's no loyalty amongst thieves. No. Well, on the uh, and there's always a trace, mm -hmm. right? You follow the money, even in cryptocurrency. You know, you're you're gonna spend that money somewhere. Right, and somebody's going to ask questions, and it's, yeah, crime doesn't pay. Isn't that what they really said when I was a kid? Yeah, crime does not pay. Well, you, it's it's why you never hear about the thieves that you know got away with it, right? It's because they always get caught. That's how we know. It's it, it's, it's right. it may be twenty years, it may be thirty years, but it, at some point, it's going to happen. We'll catch up. Yeah, because that's the thing too: is people talk. You know, you, you you say one thing and yeah, I mean, whatever, you, you can't hide the truth. You tell one person you think you can trust and then have a falling out, that's all it takes. Right. Yeah, the best way to keep a secret is to never know the secret. Yep. All right, another one uh, story from IT Pro Portal, which is a site I've never really been to before, but what caught my eye was ex Cisco staffer charged with deliberately deleting 400 plus VMs. Faces up to five years behind Ugh. bars. And I'm gonna assume, excuse me, uh, Cisco's gonna go after them for damages as well. Right, five years in jail, yeah. fine of 250,000. Cisco's claiming 1.4 million and a million to cut and refund, so another two and a half million. I know, man. And the person's name is Sudish Kasaba Ramesh. Left the company in April 2018. Accessed the firm's AWS environment months later. So there's a problem. Yeah. Cisco, you should probably have disabled these accounts. Maybe or, sign on somewhere. I don't know how you'd have, you know, whatever. That account change, was enabled. Change those shared, you know, passwords or this, you know, service account passwords when they ever anybody with access leaves. It's the basics, right? In this, in this case, lack of basics here did end up costing Cisco, according to their, to their calculation, $2.4 million in terms of their, them recovering that money. No. It's, it's just not going to happen. They well, may have filed insurance that might've been covered there. Sure. But, I mean, yeah, yeah they're not going to, who, who would hire them? Not me. Right? Maybe the Russians. But he deleted a total of 456 virtual machines, which the key, which Cisco used to run WebEx, the, the WebEx application. My gosh. So anyway, he's released on bond. I don't know, 50, his bail was only set at $50,000. It's not enough to keep you from running from five years in jail and a fine of $250,000 and zero job prospects afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. And the last one, uh, is one that I haven't cited here before, I don't think, is from the InfoSec Handler's Diary, uh, which is from SANS, one of my favorite 
places to kind of keep up to date with some cool things that are going on. This one actually comes uh, from there and the title is CenturyLink Outage Caused Internet-Wide Problems. And I actually remember something because I'm a CenturyLink user at home. Well, and CenturyLink is, I mean, it propagates everywhere. So you're going to have issues. If, if somebody like CenturyLink is having BGP issues, um, you're going to feel it in other places as well. Uh, but anyway, it's an interesting story. And this one, it either a hardware failure or a um, employee mistake. You didn't yeah. test. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't test your config first, something like that. Uh, but it was a BGP routing issue. And if you know how BGP works, BGP works. Uh, it routes between autonomous systems. So autonomous systems are, you know, big globs of essentially routers that, you know, control internet traffic. And uh, their autonomous system was basically knocked offline for a while. Yeah. Wow. And the reason why I picked that one is because, you know, the Elon Musk thing, the, the Russian Elon Musk thing, that was an internal, that was a personnel issue. At least that's who was targeted. And like you said, there are other companies that's allegedly had fallen for this. You know, mm -hmm. So we don't know the whole fallout of all that stuff. The second one, the ex Cisco staffer, that's also an employee, an insider issue. And then this one, if it was a config mistake, then this is also an insider issue. So that's why I picked these. I just thought, you know, maybe we should do an episode at some point on insider threats. You know, what's funny is uh, I working on this IR assessment. I was on insider threats and kind of the check boxes around preparation for insider threats was where I left off yesterday. So oh, before cool. you, before I even knew what you were talking about, it just happened to be where I left off. It's kind of funny. See? It's a sign, yeah, man. Maybe next week we talk to insider threats. It's, it's totally up to you, man. I think there you could take that in a lot of a lot of ways. Yeah, could be a good topic. All right. Uh, well, that's about it. Uh, for episode episode nine five is almost in the can. We do our last thing, which is shout outs. Brad, do you have any shout outs to give? Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, Renee. Uh, just she sent a really nice email over the weekend and it's just yeah. Yeah, super supportive and it's always nice to know you know that well and John and Vene as well but I just happened to think of Renee because she sent that email but it's always so great to know that you know the leadership has your back and is there for you and is not just giving you lip service right yeah Renee but, you Renee know, is awesome. It's the entire ELT. It just happened to be Renee that sent that email that I made me think of that. That's cool. Yeah, I'm going to give a shout out to Ryan Clotier. And I don't know if I've done that already once on our show, but uh, he just continues to impress me. Uh, he just, he gets things done. You know, I don't have to worry about things uh which is so cool if to have a right hand left hand man i mean you're kind of that guy in methodology stuff and things that you're doing over at fr secure he's that guy at uh in secure studio and um uh and then you hear things you know you hear things like uh, i was in a conversation with somebody else and they had said something that ryan oh it was my own uh crap who was it my son who just had a birthday and ryan had reached out to him and wished him a happy birthday and somebody else too but it's just you hear things about people third hand mm -hmm. that just can just that just confirms your original thought of yeah that really is a good dude yeah so because sometimes you you know people will just tell you things you know tell you things right. but when you hear it third third or fourth hand it's like no you're not telling me you're not just telling me things you genuinely are this kind of person yep so that's cool all right we're very grateful for our listeners and we love hearing from you so send us messages by email uh, at unsecurity at protonmail.com or check us out on twitter it's at unsecurity p 
all one word. If you uh, want to socialize with me or Brad directly, we dare you. We're not social. Well, we're kind of social. I'm, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I'm at Evan Francine and Brad's at Brad Nye. Uh, we work for people. And if you want to follow those people, Security Studio is at Studio Security and FR Secure is at FR Secure. That's it. We'll talk to you next week.